Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, The History of Punishment in India. Uh, I'm Monica Sethia, India Associate Country Director at the Lakshmi Mithil and Family South Asia Institute, Harvard University. Thank you for joining us today, late evening from India, early morning from the US, or maybe another time zone from another part of the world. For those of you joining us for the first time, I would like to just take a few minutes to introduce the Lakshmi Mithil and Family South Asia Institute, or Mithil Institute in short, before we begin with the webinar. Mithil Institute was founded to further Harvard University's engagement with South Asia, and hence the Institute works together with faculty members, researchers, and students at Harvard, and also the in-region institutions to disseminate knowledge, build capacity, and inform policy through scholarly exchanges and fellowships, sponsor lectures and conferences at Harvard and in the region, bring knowledge from South Asia to Harvard via research grants, and build a community of stakeholders. We engage in integrative research to advance and deepen the understanding about critical issues being faced in South Asia, Harvard University formally recognized the South Asia Initiative as an academic institute in 2013. We work across Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. I would like to just now, now like to introduce uh, Professor Adhanir Usmani, who's a faculty of sociology and social studies at Harvard University. Adhanir obtained his PhD in sociology from New York University in May 2017. Between 2017 and 2019, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute at Brown University. In his own words, as he says, his research is driven by two questions. Why do some people flourish while others suffer? And what explains why in some places, but not others, movements or policies emerge to challenge or moderate this inequality? Mithil Institute has been proudly associated with Professor Adhanay Rosmani's project, History of Punishment in India, since 2022, when we first funded his work through a faculty grant awarded to him. Two cycles of the projects have now been completed, and we very much look forward to hearing from Professor Adhanay and his team about the research findings. Before I turn over to Professor Adhanay to take forward the session, I would like to pass on my sincere thanks to all our panelists and the Mithil Institute team in the background who put together the session with a lot of hard work and passion. I welcome you all again. Um, enjoy the session and keep in touch with us through our social media handles, website, and email. Over to you, Adhanay. Thank you very much, Monica. Thanks very much for all of your work putting this together. Thanks to Nishant and Saba as well and everyone else who was involved. It's a real privilege and an honor. When we were first planning this webinar, we were anticipating presenting to a small group of specialists and maybe interested people. And then yesterday, Nishant told me that we had 600 registrations and all of a sudden we got very excited. So we're here. I will say that I'm very delighted to hear that there's so much interest there. What you'll be hearing from us, and I speak especially for myself, are some ideas that are still at an early stage of development. We're very keen for you to tell us what we're missing, what we haven't understood. Uh, please don't hold back. We'll have an open Q&A throughout the, throughout the session, which just means that the chat is open for you to put your questions, and we'll be taking a look at them as we go. There will be four presentations. Each of us will speak for about 15 minutes or so, but uh, we'll, we, we will be keeping an eye on the chat throughout, so you can ask questions about any presentation you've seen, maybe you ask questions about the first presentation in the third presentation because it occurs to you later. That's totally, totally fine. And I'll be introducing the speakers as we go. The order will be that I'll speak first and then we'll have three presentations and I'll introduce the order and the speakers as we proceed. So let me begin. I'll present first, as I said. So let me just begin with an overview presentation. Are my slides visible? Great. Yes. OK, so let me begin where most of my presentations begin, which is with this graph. This is a graph that illustrates the social science puzzle that has occupied most of my attention for the last few years. 
This graph shows the rate of incarceration in the United States is very, very high. Most of you, I think, will have probably heard of this fact. It's gotten quite a bit of popular attention, but I do want to just dwell and note how surprising or striking this is. The only country in world history to incarcerate such a large proportion of its population for so long seems to have been Stalin's Soviet Union. And so the fact that the United States stands in this company is kind of an extraordinary social science fact. I do want to just note though, that the judgment that the rate of incarceration in the United States has been high is the judgment that it is high relative to other times and other places. As a social science matter, this is centrally a comparative and historical puzzle. But what I've always thought very surprising about the literature on American mass incarceration is that it hasn't, it hasn't tried to study the problem of mass incarceration in a comparative and historical way. And so this, I think, has led to many, many problems in the literature. As a result, for the last four years or so, I've been working with a large team of researchers to collect comparative and historical data on punishment. And three of those researchers will be presenting after me. I'm very excited about that. Thanks to the Mittal Institute, as Monica was saying, one of our focus countries has been India. India is a country for which we have collected quite a bit of data. And Rohit will say later a little bit more about these data that we've been collecting. <clears throat> I'm gonna today use some of these data that we've been collecting to give you a general overview of the Indian case in comparative and historical perspective. Now, I think one thing that's a little awkward about this is that I'm sure that we have several specialists on the Indian case who are at, uh, attending this webinar. I am far from being a specialist. As my uh, father sometimes says about other subjects, uh, I'm sure you are will forget more about the Indian case than I will ever know. But having said that, I hope that you specialists will see that some of the facts that you know very well take on a different light or a different hue when you set them in comparative and historical perspective. So let me start with the same graph that I showed you earlier, but now with the with India highlighted rather than the United States. What you see immediately is that India stands out for almost the opposite reason. The incarceration rate in India is remarkably low in comparative and historical context, around 40 people per 100,000, which is roughly one fifteenth the rate of incarceration in the United States. Now, this is the same graph as before. It has the same set of comparators. And so that's maybe a little misleading. This shows all countries for which we in this project have collected long run data on prisoners. And so it mixes developing and developed countries. But even if you just subset to developing countries for which we have data, so this is Brazil, Ghana, Jamaica, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, these are other developing countries for which we've managed to collect a long run series. India's rate of incarceration also relative to these countries is low. In what follows, I'm going to try to say something about how you might begin to understand this. And this is emphasis on begin. This is kind of the, uh, the starting point, I think, for developing a theory of this fact. So to start with, just consider that the incarceration rate can be decomposed into the rate of crime and the rate of incarceration per crime. You can see this on your screen. And so you can just ask first, in this decompositional sense, what accounts for India's low rates of incarceration? Now, one of the challenges here is that to make this comparison, you have to estimate the amount of crime in a given society at a given time. That's quite difficult. It raises lots of conceptual and measurement challenges I will propose in this talk to do this using the homicide rate. I'm happy to talk more about this in the Q&A because it does raise some questions. And I, I, I have posted a link, or sorry, not a link, a reference to a working paper by John Clegg, Chris Lewis, and myself that elaborates these reasons in a little bit more detail. So with this, armed with this decomposition, let me just start by showing you some data from the present. What today 
explains, again, quotes around explains, what, ex what accounts for India's low rate of incarceration in this decompositional sense. The blue bar in this graph is India. The gray bar is other countries that are uh, other late developing countries. So not the developed world. I've excluded the developed world. Well, you can see that India's low rate of incarceration is accounted for by both a low rate of homicide and a low rate of incarceration per homicide, or a low rate of crime and a low rate of incarceration per crime. Now, on its own, this isn't that enlightening. It just pushes back the puzzle. I've just shown you that the puzzle of India's low incarceration rate can be decomposed into these two puzzles. So now we have to ask, how can we approach these twin puzzles? The first question is, why is the homicide rate relatively low? Again, relative to other somewhat comparable countries. And second, why is the rate of punishment per crime low as well? This is what I sometimes call the punishment rate. So let me try and say a little bit about each in turn, although this is going to be unfortunately quite truncated. The first question is why low homicide? I'd like to Note, before I say anything about this, that India's comparatively low homicide rates are a puzzle for our leading theories of crime, particularly in sociology. Those leading theories emphasize poverty and deprivation. They've been trained on cross-place and over-time differences in the United States. But they always, and many people observe this, are much more much more difficult to apply to cross-national differences. And you can think of this as, you can think of the Indian case as maybe the paradigmatic difficulty. Poverty is ubiquitous in India, but crime is much lower in India than in other poor countries. One possible promising explanation for what we could call the Indian puzzle draws on famous arguments by the great German sociologist Norbert Elias. Elias's idea was that Homicide rates, or one thing you could get glean from Elias's ideas is that homicide rates reflect not just present day realities, but also a long history of what Elias called a quote unquote civilizing process, although that term is a little misleading. It was a process basically by which people adapted to the rise of states by changing their behavior. The simple idea here is before you on the screen, where states have existed for a long time, social norms develop to discourage taking the law into your own hands. So I was just teaching Hobbes last week, and this is kind of, you can think of this as the opposite of Hobbes' war of all against all. Now, because the key idea here is that those kinds of social norms are sticky. They're passed down across generations. And so behavior reflects not just a person's present day incentives, but also the incentives that are internalized from this history. This is helpful in the Indian case, because India, even though today it doesn't possess remarkably high state capacity by any or many measures, India does have a long history of relatively high state capacity, and not just during the colonial period, but even before. And this graph shows that this pattern plausibly explains some share of the variance in cross-national homicide across countries today. I've lifted it from a recent article in the American Sociological Review, which argued that what they call ancestry-adjusted state history, which is just the population's exposure to past government, explains quite a bit of the overall cross-national variance in homicide rates. And so you can see as this regression suggests, given India's extensive state history, you can see India is towards the right-hand side of the x-axis, low homicide rates in India aren't that surprising. In fact, they're a little higher than we would expect, given India's history. There's much more to say here, but that's all I'll have to say about this first puzzle for now. So let me now turn to the second puzzle. Why the low rate of punishment per crime, per homicide? Before I say anything about this, a, a further decomposition will be helpful. So consider that the punishment rate can be decomposed into police divided by homicides multiplied by prisoners divided, uh, time, divided by police. This decomposes the punishment rate into a ratio that we can call the police footprint 
the number of police available given the rate of crime, and the penal balance, the extent to which a given society relies on prisons rather than police. I like to think of the first as something like a measure of the state's infrastructural power, a kind of measure of state capacity, while you might think of the second as something like the rate at which the state converts that infrastructural power into a stock of prisoners. Further, these two quantities are interesting, I think, because they estimate two theoretical things that are studied by criminologists. One, the term on the left, police footprint, approximates something that criminologists will call penal certainty, which is the probability that a person who runs afoul of the law will be sanctioned. The second, approximates something called penal severity, which is what happens to you conditional on encountering the infrastructural power of the state. I'll return to say more about this, uh, this, these concepts of certainty and severity in a second. But when you do this, what do you see? So again, I can show you the same graph looking at other not uh, very, not rich countries across the world today. What stands, about, stands out about India in comparison to other late developers is that its low rate of punishment is explained mainly by the latter and not the former. It's mainly explained by comparatively low levels of penal severity and ordinary levels of penal certainty. Now, thanks to the data that we have been collecting, which has been really uh, ably led by Rohit, as I'll explain in a second, we can enrich this further by looking at historical and not just comparative facts. So now consider this graph. This graph takes a little bit of explaining, but I think it's enlightening. This graph shows the same decomposition, but now using historical data. The x-axis shows the level of police per homicide, which is, as I was saying, an estimate of penal certainty. And the y-axis shows the ratio of prisoners to police, or our estimate of penal severity. I'd like you to notice three things about this graph. First, just focus on the Indian line, so the red line and the blue line. The red line is British India, the blue line is India after independence. I'd like first you even just looking at this line, just notice the movement in the vertical dimension. Don't even think about the movement in the horizontal dimension. Before independence, penal severity did not decline at all. That is, the line is more or less as high. The point is more. The points remain more or less as high in uh, 1888 as they were in 1947. But after independence, there was a remarkable decline. That's the blue line. There's a movement downwards. What that suggests is that the colonial state was much more severe than the post-colonial one. Penal severity did not decline at all in the colonial period, but after independence, there was a decline. So the colonial state was much more likely to turn its infrastructural power into a stock of prisoners. Now, there is one thing to note here, which is that prisoners over police is just an approximation of penal severity, which is the idea, what will the state do to you if it is if it catches you and chooses to sanction you. It's not the only measure of severity, it's just the kind of, it's the measure of severity that's easiest to measure across time and place. But if you look at other measures, you see a similar trend as well. So here I've shown you prison mortality, which is the number of prisoners that are dying in prison per the number of people in prison. And then also the rate at which the society, the rate at which a state turns its infrastructural power into death sentences, which is another measure of severity. You see a similar trend, a decline across the period punctuated by a decline around independence. Now, second, let's return to that graph and look at movement in the horizontal dimension, again, the red and the blue lines. Over the last 150 years, there also has been a general decline in penal certainty. So the point in 1888 is to the right of the point in 2020. But curiously, here the pattern is the opposite of the pattern in severity. Almost all of the decline in certainty takes place before independence. And after independence, certainty proves relatively stable, although it has never risen to developed 
country levels or to countries or to levels that it was at before the colonial period. And again, police over homicide, that's not the only measure we might use. It's just one of the easiest measures to compute. But other measures, like the number of homicides that result in a conviction or the general number of convictions divided by homicide, these show similar trends. Not identical trends, but similar trends. Now, the final thing I'd like you to notice about this graph is the difference between the Indian and the English lines. The English line here is kind of indicative of trends in the developed world in general. The modernization of penal states around the world, which is more or less what I've been focusing on for the last few years uh, in the developed world, it took the following form. Penal certainty increased, so there was a movement to the right, and penal severity declined, so there was a movement downward. So in general, the pattern has been a movement from the top left to the bottom right. And you can see this pattern in England, excluding the last 30 to 40 years, which I could say a little bit about in the Q&A if you'd like, the line moves down and to the right. Now, what's remarkable about the Indian penal state is that modernization takes a different form. Modernization means a movement down and to the left rather than down and to the right. And this modernization is punctuated by independence. Prior to independence, as I was saying, severity stabilized while certainty declined. After independence, severity declined while certainty stabilized. Now, this is kind of, I think, a restatement of the puzzle. How should we think about this? I propose that it shows us something like the following. Over the last 150 years, we do see unmistakably the effects of decolonization on the Indian penal state. The severity of the colonial state gives way to the comparative, and I, I would here just stress comparative, leniency of the post-independence state, at least in its formal everyday operations that we can measure. But importantly, this decolonization, or what you could just think of generally as a democratization of the state, this democratization looks different from comparable democratizations in the developed world, even if maybe it looks similar to democratizations in the post-colonial world. And we can say more about that as well in the Q&A. In the developed world, democratizations led to declines in severity and rises in certainty. But the Indian case, however, is something like democratization without certainty, or what we might call democratization without capacity. One way of thinking about this is that it's kind of a, it kind of aligns with general features of the Indian case, which were described by Atul Goli in his famous book on states in the developing world. The Indian nationalist movement experienced partial success at kind of mollifying the Leviathan that was the colonial state, but it never managed to build the political capacity to achieve all of its aims or as I put it, democratization without capacity. Well, there's a lot more to say, but let me just summarize and turn it over to the other panelists. The first thing I observed was that India has a remarkably low incarceration rate in comparative and historical perspective. And that this incar low incarceration rate is explained, or let's not say explained, but at least accounted for by the fact that both crime and punishment are low in India relative to other late developers. I then suggested that this low rate of homicide might be explained by the extensive history of state authority on the Indian subcontinent, at least relative to other places. And then to explain this low rate of punishment, I proposed that we might think of Indian democratiz Indian um, in the Indian penal state as a case of democratization without capacity. And I think this idea might help us not just understand India, but also the different lineages of state formation more generally. In general, I think one of the very helpful things about the data that we've managed to collect is that it can broaden the site of theory formation in the academy. We have a lot of theories that have been trained on metropolitan cases on the developed world, which is really a symptom of data set bias. That's really where the data exists. And so that's where the theories have been trained. But I think there's a lot to learn, not just for 
the rest of the world, but also just for our general theories of social phenomena by thinking about other cases and by having data on other cases. And so thanks to the funding from Mithil and from others, we're in a place to start asking and answering some of these questions. Okay, without that's that's what I had to say. Next, we're going to hear from Himanshu Agarwal. Himanshu is an associate professor at the Jindal Global Law School. He has an LLM from SOAS, University of London, as a Chevening scholar, and an LLM from Harvard Law School, which is where Himanshu and I first met in the classroom. Himanshu teaches legal methods and criminal psychology, and his research interests lie in criminal legal histories and psychology and law. Himanshu, take it away. Thank you, Dana. Um, I'll start sharing my screen now, so that's... Um, can, you, can you see my screen? Okay, yeah, okay, great. Um, so hello everyone. Um, I'll speak for about, well, I'm aim to speak for less than 15 minutes and uh, try to make a case for a political economic reading of the introduction and administration of whipping um, in early colonial India. Again, this is very much a work in progress and I would certainly appreciate any feedback. Um, so, so the data set here is one part of it is legislative debates uh, and other sort of historical documents such as commentaries and reports. And in the second half of the presentation, I'll focus on the kind of data that we've been collecting with the History of Punishment Project, uh, which I think helps us substantially understand the ideas that the debates themselves might uh, throw up. So initially there was um, a narrative. So may maybe we can show you a rough timeline. Yeah. So whipping was first abolished in India in 1830, 1834. This was in Bengal. This was in the context of um, the age of reform, so to say, in in England and in India, where there was narratives of civilizational backwardness, etc., and an attempt to legitimate British rule, uh, pushing for these kinds of reform. Um, so this was in 1834. However, the abolition was short-lived. Uh, immediately in Bengal in uh, 1844, it was reintroduced. But the major point for us comes after the events of 1857. Uh, they had a profound impact on the criminal justice system. Several prison prisons were destroyed. Prisoners escaped during the conflicts, leading to what Claire Anderson calls a penal crisis. Uh, plagued by severe overcrowding, transportation of prisoners, and changes in penal regimes. It is, in, it is in this context that whipping came to be reintroduced and codified across India in 1858. So the legislative debates of the Flogging Act germinated with the need to prevent jails from being overcrowded with pet petty offenders. An important purpose of flogging, as a member of the Legislative Council said, was that if fine was imposed, and was not paid, to direct corporal punishment in substitution for it was more helpful instead of overcrowding the jails by sending the offender to prison. So he, already in 1858, whipping then was an alternative to the payment of fines. Around the same time, the IPC was being finalized, the Indian Penal Code in the 1860s. There were proposals to include Clogging in sections on uh, sections on punishment of the IPC. However, since at that time it would have led to a delay in the introduction of the IPC, it was felt that a separate standalone legislation would be created for for whipping. Uh, a bill was presented uh, and passed in 1861. However, the then Viceroy refused assent. Meanwhile, IPC, which did not contain provisions for flogging, came into force. Uh, on 1st of January 1862, resulting in the suspension of flogging until a new law was passed in 1864. So this period of suspension gave almost a period of experiment. And the, the result of this experiment was then collected by lawmakers. Reports from all over India were obtained. Um, 
And these few months then provided a trial period to test the impact of suspending weapon. So what I do is read the pre-suspension debates and the post-suspension debates and notice a stark contrast. The pre-suspension debates, I argue, is a confused assemblage of multiple penological purposes. The debates cover wide-ranging goals, including the uh, and, uh, and topics such as the manner and mode of infliction of the punishment, the deterrent value of whipping, the offenses for which whipping should be allowed, etc., the classes and castes from whom whipping uh, was particularly abhorrent or particularly suitable in the eyes of the Legislative Council. Um, and there were significant class and caste based aspects articulated in these debates. For example, the debate on the mode of infliction of punishment. Uh, there was one particular member who produced medical reports of several cases where whipped convicts had later died of injuries. This prompted amendments about the presence of medical officers, the number of strikes that could be ordered, the instrument which could be used for whipping, etc. Mr. Harrington, who proposed the bill, argued for the deterrent effect of whipping, measured by the fact that most offenders were first-time offenders and were not whipped again. These data were again disputed by uh, Sir Jackson, arguing that there were several gaps in the data, etc. All members, however, repeated their claim of this notion of the present state of civilization. The quote that you see, that all members claimed an abhorrence to the punishment, but were convinced that the state of civilization in India was not sufficient to lead to a move towards abolition. So the bill was passed in 1861, um, but as we saw, it was not um, assented to by the Viceroy. And so the impact of suspension was that the debates were crystallized and a clear question of finance emerged. Mr. Roberts, who uh, proposed the new bill in uh, 1864, calculated the total loss to uh, the government to be over 2 lakh rupees per year. This figure was arrived at by the number of prisoners, the number of additional prisoners who otherwise would have been whipped and the expense incurred to house these prisoners. Um, the sole opposing voice to the bill said that instead of whipping, a resort should be had to imprisonment. He read various reports to argue that there had not been a marked difference in crime or administration due to the abolition of whipping. However, the core of his position revealed the problem that the government faced that his position would have necessitated additional expenditure in maintaining prisoners and constructing more prisons. Mr. Roberts, in reply to this opposition, claimed that if jail discipline of the English or the Irish system could be introduced, he would agree to the abolition of corporal punishment. However, he complained that the cost was enormous and exclaimed that if Sir Traglin would devote more funds to the improvement of jails, he would be glad to see the abolition of corporal punishment. And Mr. Harrington, who had introduced the previous bill, was the only one to maintain the logic of civilizational difference after suspension. So what I'm arguing is that it was purely for financial reasons, ultimately, that whipping became reintroduced. Now, if we move towards how it was administered, and this is where the data from uh, the pro from the history project might come in. Um, firstly, I argue that whipping worked in conjunction with the network of other punishments, especially fines and imprisonment, underscoring the infliction of punishment of transportation and imprisonment as background. I argue that each of these punishments was imposed in tandem with the others to minimize cost. Whipping here was used in cases where fines could not be recovered from convicts, especially in pet petty offenses. First, the move, uh, the move from extramural prison labor or outdoor labor to indoor or industrial prisons was explicitly driven by costs. The state was absolute loser by employing convict labor on roads because the cost of superintendence of these convicts 
far exceeded their value of labor, and thus it would have been more profitable to keep them idle. Hence, there was a major push towards constructing new prisons and prison industries. And this push then led to the creation of large central prisons. So this is one example uh, drawing from the work of Mira Waits, who argues that the prison industry became the central feature of the central prisons that came to be built at this, at this point. Um, and for and this in turn led to the abolition of small jails. The government sought to tap into an economy of scale. And so smaller jails where prisoners were sentenced to less than six months of imprisonment was gradually done away with. Despite the considerable cost of transport of prisoners from uh, smaller jails to central prisons, central prisons still proved to be economically viable. For the purposes of prison labor, Habitual and life sentenced prisoners were viewed as best potential laborers because they were permanently incarcerated and did not have to be constantly retrained. In this context, then, um, whipping became the go to punishment for petty offenses of prisons who would otherwise have been incarcerated in small jails. Flogging and fines were resorted to to overcome the problem of overcrowding. And in Punjab and out, there was a systematic policy of replacing short-term imprisonment with fines and flogging for reducing costs. The underlying economic logic of the coercive network of judicial punishments then seems to be that the long-term imprisonment was made productive through the labor extraction in industrial centralized prisons. Smaller sentences were dissuaded, fines were to be imposed. In cases where the accused was not in a position to pay a fine, whipping then was to be resorted to. Uh, what you see here is a circular that explicitly gives instructions to judges as to how the discretion of uh, sentencing should be exercised. Uh, and they say the object of the laws is to deal effectively with offenders who are too poor to pay a fine, who are not deterred from crime by short terms of imprisonment, and who would therefore needlessly crowd jails. So the underlying logic of introducing whipping that we saw in the legislative debates is now translated to the bureaucracy through these um, government orders. Now, if we look at the example of flogging in famines, the economic logic underlining, undergirding the system becomes apparent. Bengal experienced a famine in 1866 and 67. I found from an analysis of annual reports, and this is data that we've been collecting for the history of punishment project, that the number of whippings increased many fold as compared to imprisonment and fines. Um, to get a sense of the context, the famine in Bengal and Orissa during 1866, 67 was devastating. In Orissa, for, for example, about 800,000 people died. Uh, which was a loss of over 30% of the population. In this context, then there was extreme poverty and hunger, and there was a resultant rise in the number of crimes. Most of the decoity cases were also grain robberies committed by starving people in search of food. And the statistics of crime rose and fell according to the price of grain. Given this famine-stricken rise in crime, there was about a 25% rise in the total number of convictions that year, from about 66,000 to 80,000 in Bengal. Interestingly, however, the number of fines imposed increased by less than 10%. Imprisonment increased by more than 25%. And more starkly, uh, whipping increased by 282%. These numbers show how during the famine-stricken years, the state was not in a position to impose or extract fines from the population. Neither was it willing to feed more people inside prison. Hence, the ratio of whipping to fines, shown in red here, and the ratio of whipping to imprisonment increased sharply during the famine years, as shown in the graph. And the fall in numbers of whipping and imprisonment was equally sharp in the years after the famine, with only fines increasing that year. The findings from the Bengal data um, are repeat throughout the 19th century, uh, thus in the Great Famine of 1876-78, the state's response 
uh, was again to resort to whipping. And in 1877, the total number of Indians whipped was 72,000, uh, of which 28,000 were from Madras. Uh, the next year, 75,000 Indians were, were whipped. Um, and for comparison, in the famine year of 1866, the number of people who were whipped in Madras was 26,000. In 1867, it was 3,000 in Madras compared to 28,000 in 1877. Um, so it is these kinds of comparisons, not only across countries and time, but within the country, across different states, that is made possible by these, um, by these data. Um, to conclude then, um, I think it is arguable from the case of whipping that firstly, I want to sort of emphasize that we should also look towards uh, Rush and Kirschheimer's kind of theorizing of uh, the goal of punishment, that the posturing that goes on during lawmaking about purposes, including civilizational progress, retribution, deterrence, etc., while important, should not keep us away from also studying economic logic underlying punishment. Um, and this data then helps us study this and bring this out more clearly. Uh, many of the kind of goals that are articulated, such as retribution, may not be amenable to empirical study as much as economic logic is, and it's sort of more strongly demonstrated here. Uh, so I'll stop there. I, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Manchu. Very, very rich. Next is uh, Sebastian Spitz. Before I introduce Sebastian, I just want to say I see some people asking questions, which is excellent. Um, some very, very uh, great questions being asked. Please continue to ask them. And then what we will do is after all the presenters have spoken, we'll launch into the Q&A, and that's when we'll try and answer them. Um, so next is Sebastian. Sebastian is a PhD student at the sociology department at Harvard. He also has a JD from Harvard Law School. Sebastian is, uh, even though he may only be a graduate student at this point, is someone who has been leading the history of punishment data set collection, I can say. And so uh, in many ways, he is the uh, principal investigator, I would say. And so if you have any difficult, very difficult questions, as I see already some difficult questions are coming in, I will be sure, Sebastian, to hand them over to you. But without further ado, Sebastian. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Adoner. <clears throat> One minute. Uh, great. So hello, I'm going to be presenting race and cost comparisons, why class matters. Uh, what I am presenting is tentative and preliminary, and I appreciate your questions and feedback. So I want to begin by answering a simple empirical question. Is cost inequality in incarceration in India comparable to racial inequality? In incarceration in the U.S. On your left-hand side is the incarceration rate across different cost groups in India. The incarceration rate for scheduled cost, the SC, is about 34 per lakh population, and for the forward or general costs, it's about 35. On the right-hand side, you have incarceration rate by race in the United States. The incarceration rate of African Americans is over 1,400 per lakh population, whereas for whites, it's above 200. So in India, shockingly to us, the scheduled costs actually have a slightly lower incarceration rate than the forward cost, or ratio of 0.98. Whereas in the US, Black people are much more incarcerated than white people, with the Black incarceration rate five and a half times higher. And I should note that data we have from other countries like Australia, New Zealand, England, are much more similar to the US in terms of their uh, rates of inequality and in, in incarceration, which leads us to ask the question of why there is no cost gap in incarceration, or very small. You can see that the scheduled 
tribes uh, are more incarcerated than the forward caste. The best explanation for the lack or, or very small cost gap is about the different relationship between class and incarceration in the US and India. So consider the following graph. In India, the ratio of incarceration between people who are illiterate and people with college degrees is just two to one. You can see the, the left and right uh, side of, of this graph. Not shown in the United States, the ratio of the incarceration rates of high school dropouts and college graduates is 50 to one. So class inequality and incarceration is much greater in the US. Given that class and cost map onto each other closely, though in somewhat different ways that I'll get into uh, later in the presentation, low levels of class inequality and incarceration likely contribute to, to low levels of cost inequality and incarceration in India. Here's a graphical way of thinking about this. In the US and India, race and cost affect class very strongly. I'll go again slightly differently. But the size of the overall effect is very similar. That's the thick blue line. However, in the US, there is a thick green line between class and incarceration. Prisons here are filled with poor people. Whereas in India, the green line is very thin. There's little, compar comparatively, class inequality and incarceration. In both countries, there's a direct effect of race and cost on incarceration, respectively through police and court bias. This is a relatively thin curved red line, but this explains a minority of the disparities, hence why even with the presence of discrimination, cost inequalities in incarceration are low. So why is class inequality in Indian incarceration low? Some of it, perhaps much of it is a regional story in which rural areas have low incarceration rates and many people with low education. Data we have from Delhi shows a much more standard class distribution of punishment, though still less unequal than the US. Relatedly, it might also be a function of low state capacity and the state not having the resources to prosecute crimes committed by the poor against the poor. Returning to the subject of cost inequality, when we saw the graph I presented at the beginning, I was curious about how race and cost have been compared in scholarly literature and whether we should look to differences between the nature of cost and race and explaining why incarceration rates by race are, race are unequal, but not cost. I end up thinking these differences aren't crucial for incarceration, but that they do matter in other contexts. And so in reviewing this cost race literature, I found three basic positions. These views are stylized exaggerations, but are helpful in identifying the different arguments. What I refer to as the liberal view argues that American race is reducible to cost. Isabel Wilkerson's recent book, Cost, which is a book about race in the United States, exemplifies this tradition. Note that the understanding of cost and thus race in the liberal view is ideational. Indian cost and American race are both rooted in custom, feeling, discrimination, status, and disgust, not importantly, economics. The liberal view has been sharply criticized by some black Marxists. Their critique is that race in the final analysis can be reducible to class relations dating back to slavery. But these black Marxists accept the liberals view of cost as being non-material and Oliver Cromwell Cox's 1948 work is probably the quintessential uh, example of this tradition. Finally, there is a view closest to the one I will develop what Chabria refers to as cost capitalism. This approach calls attention to the quote, specific material base of, basis of cost, agreeing with the black Marxists on the class origins of race, but arguing against their tacit acceptance of liberal understandings of cost. Here, I will sketch out a novel theory linking race, class, and cost. Given that race and cost are at the least institutional cousins, how are we to understand their relationship? The answer is not the liberal approach, which collapses cost and race. Alternatively, we need to take the black Marxist critique seriously, looking at the different class origins of cost and race. The origins of race in America is class oppression, specifically the enslavement of black Africans, 
and the enslavement of those Africans' children in order to exploit their labor. This is class in the traditional Marxist sense. At the origins of racial division, class boundaries and race boundaries were close to coterminous. All enslaved persons were black. All people of high standing were white. Knowing someone's class would, you, would allow you to predict their race with near certainty. Cost, of course, does not originate in slavery. But the black Marxists are wrong to view cost as non-material. After all, a core element of cost is that it corresponds to occupation within a division of labor. This is true both for Varnas and for the more specific Jatis. As an ideal type, and of course the reality has never corresponded entirely, cost position is class position, with class understood as what one does. This, for those versed in classical sociology, in class. For Emil Durkheim conceptualized class at the level of specific occupations, predicting occupation-specific organization. In their association to occupations, jatis are Durkheimian classes. While both race and caste have their origins in class systems, neither today is reproduced mainly through a class structure. Knowing one's class position does not tell you one's race or caste, nor is the reverse true. Race and caste in this sense today are far closer to Weber's conception of status groups than class groups. There remains, of course, important economic inequality by cost and race. But there is now a significant overlap in the economic well-being of the oppressed and oppressor group. There are Black billionaires, Black political leaders with backing from a large Black professional class, just as there is a creamy layer of well-to-do Dalits and other lower costs. Yet, even when Blacks or Dalits achieve economic or other social success, they remain stigmatized as a result of their group membership. The social position of poor Black people, or poor Dalits, of course remains miserable. But this suffering is a result of more than just race, in the words of William Julius Wilson, and more than just cost. To summarize then, at their origins, cost and race were based on different types of class systems, but they are converging to being non-class status hierarchies. But this convergence is not complete. As you know, the cost-occupation linkage has been broken only since independence in the last few decades. Race-class linkages were strong in the Jim Crow South, with most Blacks working as sharecroppers or domestic laborers. We should still expect to find vestiges all of the old class race and ca class cost order in contemporary data. That is, the class origins of the respective social systems should shape their contemporary functioning. We know that inequalities by race and cost are generally quite large, but the social outcomes in which race or cost have particularly high inequality might differ. The cost-race literature thus far has been theoretical, dancing angels on a pin with no end in sight. I proposed a theory of class, cost, and race, and it's time we started to test these different theories, which have different observable implications. In the next part of the presentation, I will compare quantitatively levels of inequality between the two settings, as I did with incarceration. Let's begin with a basic assumption. Race and cost discrimination are rampant in the respective societies. We have no a priori reason to believe that measures of discrimination should be higher or lower by cost or race. Consider employment discrimination on resumes based on the cost or race association of someone's name. This happens at about the same rate. People with Dalit sounding names are 60% 60 less likely to get an interview compared to 50% for African Americans. And interestingly, African Americans and scheduled costs experience similar levels of residential segregation. And the income gap by race and cost is quite similar, a ratio of 1.89 for cost and 1.78 for race. The income data are important because income is the most basic measure of economic well-being, and the similarity of the inequality shows that cost and race really are of the same scale in terms of how much they impact people's lives. Returning to the class origins theory of race and cost, where might we expect cost inequality to be particularly large? Occupational dissimilarity. Given that cost originally corresponded with occupation, we should expect vestiges of that class cost scheme to persist to today, even as many Indians, probably most, no longer practice their costs heritage trade. With regards to race, 
Slavery determined an individual's relationship with the means of production, since slaves were literally the means of production for the owner. But it did not necessarily determine the precise task someone performed. Most slaves worked on the field, but some worked in the home or in a trade. The core racial stratification brought by slavery was not in the specific task one worked, but in the relationship to property and the means of production. Thus, occupational dissimilarity across caste should be greater than occupational dissimilarity across race today. This is what I find uh, in terms of the dissimilarity scores, though I note that this is still very preliminary. Conversely, where might racial inequality be larger than caste inequality? Wealth would be a good candidate. Enslaved, pe enslaved people could not own property by law because they were property. After emancipation, the United States did not redistribute land from plantation owners to the freedmen and women. In many cases, they continued to work on those same plantations as sharecroppers. The median wealth of white people was more than 50 times the median wealth of black people in 1860, prior to the Civil War. In the Indian case, of course, the cost structure prevented the significant accumulations of wealth among Dalits. But there were variations in cost structures between villages, and there was no absolute prohibition in acquiring wealth as in the American case. For instance, data from 1866 land registers show small but existent land holdings among Dalits. Thus, we should expect greater wealth inequality today by race than cost. And as you can see, this is the case. The difference is actually quite large, with white people having 13 times the wealth of black people, compared to a ratio of 3.5 to 1 for the general to or forward cost to scheduled cost. But there are limits to my approach. I don't think it explains this, these educational trends in which there's much higher educational inequality than racial inequality. This is probably due to the fact that education is just much more unequally distributed in India than in the US. Now, you might suppose this has to do with the traditional Brahmin interest in learned professions, but we have to take into account the basic distribution of education in thinking about this inequality. So let's sum up what we've learned about class, cost, and race. We found low rates of inequality in incarceration by cost and class in India. Uh, we focused, we talked about the importance of class origins of cost and race and why we think that these continue to matter today. Uh, and we found empirically that cost and race inequalities are different, uh, but that there's not going to be one overarching explanation for all these differences, even as the class origins of these systems is going to explain uh, many of these differences. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks very much. So much to think about. Um, the last but not least is uh, Rohit Sharma. Rohit is a a uh, researcher, he's been working very centrally with the history of punishment in India project. In fact, I would say he's been running it single handedly. Um, he's also, and this is partly what he's going to be speaking about today, he's also been working to conceptualize this uh, knowledge hub at a Delhi based not for profit project, Second Chance, which aims to bridge the knowledge and practical gap between academia and uh, prisoners and ex-prisoners, under trial prisoners. And that's something that I think we're also, uh, we would like not just to understand the world, but to change it. And that is that spirit is really alive in what Rohit does. I also just want to say that Rohit and I met very serendipitously because Rohit emailed me out of the blue a few years ago. And I would say that email is maybe one of the best things that has happened to me over the last few years. That's how our collaboration began and he's done really extraordinary work most of the credit for our extensive data collection in India which I think it might be the most extensive data set that uh, anyone has built on the history of punishment in India that goes to the credit for that goes to Rohit so thanks Rohit I'm very excited to hear what you have to say as well thank you thank you so much and um, thanks to all the 132 attendees uh, who have been here can you hear me uh, properly okay great um so thanks everyone for coming on uh, Monday evening after seeing another Rohit Sharma not performing well yesterday. Uh, so this project, uh, this presentation is about how to utilize the data and stories to enable civil societies. Um, and so what is this presentation about? Um, I'll broadly give an overview about what all data points uh, we have collected so far and what's the importance of this criminal justice data 
Uh, third uh, part would be introduction of India Prison Portal, which is like very initial phases, but I hope to present some bits. And this is the first time we are presenting the idea somewhere. And the founder of uh, Project Second Chance, Mohit, is also here. Um, and last but not least, how we can come all of come together to support this ecosystem. So um, what have we collected so far? First is, um, in, there are two kinds of data sets, which as, uh, as part of uh, punishment project we are documenting. One is national data and one is subnational data. In terms of national data, we just consolidate all the national point of view, which is like India in 1867, how many prisoners were there, or India in 2021, how many death sentences were there. So we are just documenting national data points when we talk about national data. So, so far we have uh, documented around 3200 points for 50 plus statistics, which includes death sentences, prisoners, admissions, acquittals, arrest, uh, and the earliest national data point as part of this project is of 1823 death sentences and latest is 2021 because we are still waiting for BPRD, PSI um, and the new uh, reports to come in including census. Um, and third point is uh, a total data point which have, we have collected so far is this one and I know it sounds very, it looks very scary but on left hand side you can see what all are the statistics, uh, police pending, police, prisoners, conviction etc. And uh, on, on this axis, you can see that the year is mentioned. So you can see that there are so many data points uh, from 1870 onwards, which we can see. And we are hopeful that some, we will get some better data analysis to visualize it better. Uh, but overall, if we uh, see that what are, are the priority national statistics available. So if we talk about police, we have uh, data from 1840 onwards uh, with around 181 years of national data. Uh, in terms of population, we have data from 1866. Um, uh, conviction data is from 1877 and so on. So you can see that uh, if anyone wants to research mostly on how many, what was the social spending on education so far uh, in the country, uh, the first data point we have is of 1852 and the data is of 111 years. Um, so these are the broadly the uh, data points which we have uh, documented so far and it is still in the process and we are hopeful um, that everything will be done in our next uh, one month. So in terms of subnational data, what have we collected? So uh, as I mentioned earlier, subnational data is more detailed data. It does not just talk about India, but it goes another layer uh, into what all states uh, had incarceration rates, how many police were there, and, and so on. Um, and it's not just the data points. It's also what kind of gender division was there in prisoners, what kind of gender division was there for police. Uh, and uh, Unfortunately, we don't have detailed caste-based demarcation because the caste got consolidated in reports substantially later. But uh, in terms of prison statistics India report, we have tried to put it in, in a uh, Excel format, which might be utilizable and save some time for other people who are researching on history of punishment. So I'll just give you a bit of example. Uh, uh, so, so far in subnational data, we have 71,000. 770 data points and I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it's gonna be around um, 85,000 uh, by end of uh, next one and um, so I'll just give you an example of what subnational data looks like so consider example of Assam um, we have data from 1879 to 2021 and you will get a detailed uh, scope of how gender uh, how, how many like the gender divide of the prisoners as well as the sentence length. Um, the yardstick of sentence length was substantially different in colonial time because they used to uh, document people from zero, uh, point 0 to 15 days, 15 days to 6 months, 6 months to 2 years. So the division was slightly different. So we need to homogenize that data point, but it, it still is available. Um, in terms of statistics, uh, we have admissions data, uh, charges data, uh, conviction, court cases, and so on. Uh, population data is very interesting because uh, you can uh, we can get access of gender, age, and religion-wise divide. So if we have another secondary source which talks about uh, the incarceration of Muslims in Assam, so we have comparable uh, uh, from this population division data that what was the representation of uh, Muslims in prison. So of course, in terms of primary source, we might not have that kind of detailing. But if if this data comes together with another source, uh, another documentation, this will have a larger picture. Um, and fortunately, in terms of NCRB, uh, NCRB started uh, uh, in 1955, but in terms of Assam, good data starts uh, on subnational level from 1964 when they gave a division of juvenile admissions, arrest and acquittals. Uh, 
Um, and then comes present statistics of India report, uh, which is 1995 onwards. We have utilized that for Assam too, where um, we get data on education, religion, caste, etc. We uh, don't have uh, data from 1948 to 1965. That is something which we hope to build in upcoming time. Uh, why have we collected all the data? So first is, of course, uh, we wanted to aid all the qualitative work which is done by all the researchers and organization. Because once uh, a lot of researchers don't have the kind of uh, uh, bandwidth to or, or to invest that kind of energy to get this kind of rich data at one place. And we have cross-national uh, comparative data points which you guys can use. And we hope to create uh, this data as a public good. Um, second is, in terms of fragmented data frames, we have around 17,000 police station, 13, 19 prison, etc. for 1.54 billion population with 49 million pending cases. And these uh, uh, data frames have been used in silos. So we, through this project, we also hope that India can uh, uh, come together, like all of the stakeholders can come together to create a robust public data infrastructure. And of course, national judicial data grid is a good example. But uh, we will need mo much more than that because we'll have to wait for present statistics in the report to know what is the picture. So there has to be like a uh, uh, common platform where all of us can uh, come together. Um, and third is, of course, data can sometimes pose interesting question and can warrant a face and story. So for example, this is the data for uh, homicide uh, and death sentences. So if you see death sentences substantially reduced after um, 1950, uh, or you see uh, homicide data uh, have a slight jump here. So it, it homicide data and prisoner data, there's there's some consistency with the kind of uh, the Garam Dal movement, which came uh, as part of Bhagat Singh uh, and all the revolution, where the, they, they divided from INC. So you can see that when uh, there was an entire group which prompted uh, Britishers to take stricter action, which lead to more incarceration rates too. So there are, there are some stories behind these data points also on how, um, uh, how, they, how the Britishers adopted the colonial policies. Um, and what is the coverage and limitation? So of course, um, we don't have crime records uh, from 48 to 55 uh, uh, because Crime and in India report came afterwards. Um, and business record in terms of subnational we don't have from 1948 to 1995, and that is something which we hope to build. Uh, one thing, um, one one thing which all of the like the previous data also shows is that a lot of crimes were defined later on. So the, these data points also give us question to inquire uh, what how were the crimes defined in colonial uh, era and how they translated back after independence too. So um, there are a lot of questions, and we hope uh, that uh, like to through this data we can identify who were the criminals. And especially like someone in the chatbot also asked how under trial have a larger representation. So of course, if we see latest prison statistics in the report, 64% of the under trial population has educational quali qualification of less than 10th pass. So we can see there is a pattern which uh, and there is a story behind these data which uh, can be identified. And how what did this data lead to? So we believe that data and stories uh, will help criminal justice system. And we uh, this entire discussion also lead to a hope that we can create a collaborative state uh, network. So I was um, I was discussing this idea sometime back with one of a friend, Mohit, uh, that I want to host this data on a public platform where everyone can use it. And Mohit at the same time was discussing, I want to create a platform where I want to put all the knowledge of uh, his fellows. So the fellows work, fellows are ex-prisoners and under prisoners who are working to design a solution around prisons, around mental health, around legal aid access to library amongst other ideas. So Project Second Chance has been doing that. So we collaborated and um, the, we conceptualize the India Prison Portal. Um, the idea is, of course, making knowledge accessible. Uh, we believe data is public good. And of course, data cannot compensate for the stories, for the high incarceration rate for a lot of marginalized community. But of course, we can say it can at least give us some logic, some insights behind that. Um, and we hope to create a platform where everyone comes together. Um, so what is India Prison Portal? Um, we are we are imagining it as a, like a Google for criminal justice system. So the idea is also largely inspired by very powerful work by uh, people archives of rural India on how they are documenting the stories of rural India. We want to imagine how a lot of academia, a lot of research, a lot of organizations have so rich learning, but they are not uh, coming together. All of the knowledge are in silos. And we through this platform, we hope to document all these knowledge together. So themes we are covering include prison economy, overcrowding. So if suppose there's a there's a YouTube video about overcrowding, it might be on the platform. It will come on the platform. There's a podcast by ex-prisoners on how legal it affected them. 
and how how in delhi they had to change 11 lawyers to get the 12th lawyer who ultimately handled their cases so these are very powerful stories right like and we and and the and the idea with which we are conceptualizing this, this platform is how we can get prisoner stories at the forefront and how academia research can play a secondary role to document all the knowledge uh, at one platform and the type of content we are hosting our case studies editorial podcast documentary and other places so of course i'm looking forward to um, a lot of organizations collaborating with us because um, i'll just play this how uh, the india prison portal will look like so again it's a very uh, rough uh, draft so so this is going to be like a home page where you can find all the themes which i had mentioned and once i suppose click on post lee's life of prisoners so the, the platform will come uh, there are articles so imagine five five uh, platforms articles are here so we are not we are not uh, hosting these platform we are just giving redirect link with a small summary the suppose ek, one ex prisoners come on this platform and they click legal aid there might be three hindi compendium one marathi compendium on how they can access legal aid so uh, once I, I I can get the kind of content which is on uh, this theme, so podcasts, articles, um, and uh, there you can search through what kind of document you are looking for, what kind of keyword you are looking for, what kind of data sets are you looking for. So these keywords will help you to access directly. And there's also be your top choices where you can see what all are the prison based articles which uh, everyone is reading, which is the, the larger viewership. And we can search by theme, we can search by content. Um, uh, we also hope that prisoners and academia people will write together some sometime uh, and that's how knowledge sharing uh, will uh, work so a lot of people in this call are also experts and we want you to come together uh, we want you to join the community uh, where ex prisoners under trial prisoners can learn from your wisdom and you can learn from their lived experience and uh, we hope that uh, this india prison portal became not just an idea but a movement in upcoming years what it is not, it is not an exclusive siloed effort. It does not, uh, Project Second Chance has been doing wonderfully, but this is like the baseline for us. We want all of the all of the ex-prisoners, under trial prisoners come together, prison officials, police officials, judiciary officials, civil societies, law students, anyone who believes that criminal justice system warrants some improvement to come together. Um, and of course, people who want to support us financially in other, in other way. Uh, who supported me? Of course, I was very inspired with uh, all, all of the work uh, done by on death penalty by uh, 39A, a lot of amazing restorative justice work by uh, uh, Project Second Chance, Ashiana Foundation, amazing, amazing uh, stories, PAR. So there are a lot of amazing uh, human rights organization uh, working in the prison space uh, who inspired me to uh, conceptualize something like this with Mohit. And uh, this, this is my QR code where you can reach out to me. You can reach out to me on email address. And hopefully we are going to host all our public data on this platform and take a step towards this. And uh, hopefully better prisoners, right? That's the main idea. So here's to more kindness and collaboration in this world. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Rohit. Um, so sorry we're running a little behind time. We have about 16 minutes to answer 12 very excellent questions. So I'm going to try to group them as best as possible. Sebastian, maybe I'm going to start with you. You had two questions. I'm not sure if you can see the questions yourself. I, I can't see the questions. And have you, oh, maybe for everyone else, it would be helpful to read them out as well. So while you think about what you want to say, I'll read them out. How about that? So one, uh, so Sebastian, one question was from, um, Marilanini, which said that the ratios of wealth inequality and even incarceration rates do not necessarily infer that race produces more disparities than caste. As caste is a system of graded inequality, metrics should include not just the comparison with Dalits, but also include scheduled tribes, OVCs, and oppressed castes. Um, another question, oh, same uh, person was, Sebastian, would you use population proportions of marginalized communities in both contexts to speak to disparities in outcomes? Because within the Indian context, upper castes form a minority of the population. How would that impact the data findings with respect to the comparison to race? That's something, Sebastian, I know you've been thinking a lot about. So why don't you start with those and then we'll go to the next after that. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, thank you for the questions. And as Adoner can tell you, the first version of this talk had an extra 10 minutes of of explaining all the difficulties uh, with making these comparisons, which is a, which is a really um, it's an important issue. Uh, in pop, in the 
population shares mat uh, differ between groups, you know, in different countries. So like if you're comparing white to black inequality in the U.S., that's very different than in South Africa, where black people are a majority of the population, unlike the U.S. Uh, in terms of the scheduled tribes and OBCs, I've decided to focus on the scheduled costs in this presentation because I thought they were the most analogous to African Americans. The scheduled tribes, it struck me, were more comparable to Native Americans. Uh, so that's why I was not focusing on them. Um, and I would also just say that in terms of the vast majority of these outcomes, if you combine the scheduled costs and the scheduled tribes, they look very similar to each other. So it's not that wasn't making a huge uh, difference in terms of the outcomes. Uh, I agree about the different population structures. OBCs are the largest group, whereas in the U.S., white people are a majority of the population. Uh, you know, that is going to have um, that can have certain consequences. It's something Adana and I are actively writing about. I would say that both race and cost have gradations within these state categories. We have to use the state's categories because that's where what the data are, but there's inequality by skin color among African Americans with darker skin people more you know, more discriminated against, just as there are gradations within cost the state's cost categories. Um, so I mean these are these are live issues throughout, but uh, we're comparing the, the state's categories either by race or by cost because that's what exists. And in, and in terms of incarceration, I mean I did the, bar, the bars of schedule of scheduled tribes and OBCs, and it's pretty similar on on most of these outcomes. So it's not um, you know it's an analytic choice because we have to make analytic choices, but I don't believe that the results are super sensitive to those analytic choices. They're, they're robust to what we're, we're looking at. So, but I, I, but I appreciate the question and it's one that we're actively thinking about. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, Himanshu, I'm gonna direct the next two questions at you. You received two questions. Uh, I'm not sure, is it worth me reading them out? Can attendees- no, so I read them, so the first- But I, mean, well, I, I just don't know if, if everyone else who's attending, can everyone else who's attending see the questions or is it only us who can see the questions? Does anyone know? Um, it's just the the panelist okay. so it would for the audience. Okay, so it would be helpful to review the questions. Okay, great. So one question, uh, Himanshu, was um, about the caste and class implications on corporal punishment, which I think you addressed a little bit, but you can say a little bit more of in light of this question. And then the other question was about how to think about, this is a challenging question, how to think about the compare how, how to compare the long-term outcomes of people who are in prison to the long-term outcomes of people who were with. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, both great questions. So Anushka's question on caste, I absolutely agree that there is absolutely an overlap between class and caste and this notion of uh, people who are able to pay fines not being whipped, mapping on to class and caste boundaries uh, in India. And this I mean, so I didn't present all of this material today, but um, we can see this at all stages of uh, the law, at the stages of law making and implementation. Uh, and finally, when judges are being called upon to justify their decisions, even there you can see this. So in terms of uh, legislative debates, there is already uh, concerns about the educated native being compared to the European, that is the landholding uh, or the babus being whipped would be uh, a very sort of uh, big thing and would have a huge impact. And therefore, there is a lot of discretion being given uh, to judges at the time of sentencing. And caste is specifically emphasized as a factor that must be taken into consideration by the judges when exercising this discretion. One example of how this was communicated to judges was what we saw earlier in the circular of 1867 in my presentation where, again, caste, etc., was specifically mentioned. And there again, they mentioned if you could uh, extract a fine, uh, then you should do that instead of uh, whipping a person. Um, in terms of uh, an example of judges justifying their actions, so there was a case of 
a boy who was sentenced to be whipped for plucking a flower in Alfred Park. And there was a sort of an inquiry into this incident. And the justification was that the youth was of the Tamuli caste. He was aged 17 years. A sentence of 12 steps was passed. The flower was rare, valuable, and plucked uh, it deliberately. Offender was not a high caste boy. Uh, and the original um, archive, the emphasis of the judge is on the caste of the person. Uh, so yes, very much so, caste and class completely overlapped uh, with the penal policy of extracting fines, and if not, then whipping. Um, as to the other question of Benjamin Callan, I really don't know, I don't have the data, uh, but yes, it, it's, I mean, I certainly don't make a normative judgment on whipping itself. I am certainly open to, I mean, I don't say that whipping is better than imprisonment or worse than imprisonment. In terms of um, places we could look for this data, I think Singapore continues to have um, whipping as a punishment. It'd certainly be interesting to uh, compare longitudinal studies from there. Um, in addition to the point you're making about the brutality of prisons, I think in an additional factor in favor of whippings could also be the impact on families of uh, prisoners. So long-term incarceration has sort of intergenerational impact on families, etc. So if instead you have whipping where the dread earning member is still released and can continue to work, etc., that can certainly have a longer impact. The impact on families seems to be something that the lawmakers in colonial India were certainly aware of. And it was one another factor that went into uh, justifying the use of whipping in petty cases. But yeah, I, I mean, at the moment, I have no idea. I have no data to answer your question particularly. Yeah, but I'd certainly be interested in chasing that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. I'm going to try and answer quickly a couple of questions that have come in that are related. Uh, and then, Rohit, I'm going to ask you to say a little bit about what I, uh, the the parts that I failed to answer, and then also say a little bit about our plans to maybe make the data set public. Um, and I can say a little bit about that as well. So the first the first question, which is a very difficult uh, and important question, which I uh, think uh, I really appreciate being asked is, one of the limitations of the history of punishment project in general and the history of punishment in India project specifically is that what we're really studying um, for the most part is the formal state decreed forms of punishment that get recorded. So in some ways, I think one of the challenges for us is that a lot of the time when you're doing this, you're like that famous story about the drunk man looking for his keys under the uh, street light. That's kind of the position we find ourselves in is that we're only able to look at things really that the, this is again, for the most part that the state records. And that means that for instance, when I, uh, in my presentation was arguing that what we see is a comparatively lenient form of judicial punishment, that shouldn't necessarily be taken to imply that extrajudicially there isn't high severity and extreme forms of punishment. So that's a challenge and that I think is important to note for a theoretical reason, which I think is often that in certain contexts, when you get limited formal punishment, you do often see also quite high extrajudicial punishment. I think there are reasons to think that is true in the Indian case, but all we're studying really is the judicial part of this. Um, the other thing I wanted to just comment on briefly was there, a couple of people asked this question about whether our count of prisoners includes people who are under trial. When in general across the world we count prisoners, we don't take into consideration whether or not they've been sentenced or unsentenced. So we include the under trial in our measure of prisoners everywhere. That's our, I mean, sometimes sources don't make it perfectly clear. So there I'm sure is some error in our data sets, but in general, our goal is to include the under trial. What we do also have is data on the proportion of prisoners who are sentenced in many places. So it's possible to also estimate the proportion under trial across time and place. And there is a piece that um, Sebastian and myself and a couple of other people have worked on that's coming out in the annual review of criminology next year, which does some work to look at that comparison across place and time. And your 
assumption, the questioner's assumption that India has a relatively high rate of under trial is true. Uh, and I think that's typically true of low capacity states. Um, but rates of under trial prisoners in general um, is high, are, are remarkably high around the world as well. I will say India is not alone in, in that. And then the last thing maybe that uh, we can answer, and I'll take a look if there are any other questions as well, but the last thing, Rohit, I thought maybe you could answer was say a little bit for everyone about our plans to make this public. I'll just say on our part that in general, our goal with the History of Punishment Project is to make the data set public, but this is probably a few years away at least. I hope not in the India case. So our hope was that the India case would actually be a test case for us where we'd be able to make it public sooner. But we do have a responsibility before we make it public to do error checking, to go back over and to make sure we're not making any mistakes. Some errors will obviously be found once we make it public and people hopefully will have a way to correct those mistakes. But we have some due diligence to do before we can make it public. But Rohit, why don't you say a little bit more about that as well? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I was show, showing the idea of India Prison Portal, in the first phase, we are focusing mostly on literature bit. Data part, I think, um, as Adhanan pointed out, it requires a lot of uh, back and forth reviewing what all we have documented. Uh, and I ideally, if any of you want to know particular time frame, you can reach out to me. I can probably direct you to primary source, uh, which helped me to document that data. But uh, the final data set, which requires like 70,000 data points, it will take us some time to review and uh, make it public probably. Uh, and my uh, my research uh, bit works uh, and at and in April. So I'm hopeful that before that, I will be able to do some bits. And um, as Edna said, we are also, it's like a pilot for us also. So hopefully, but you, you guys can reach out to me if you want to get access of primary source for particular years in terms of prison data. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think it might just be best to leave it there. There are a lot of other excellent questions in the Q&A, but I think we're running out of time. Um, but I will say that we're very happy to also try to answer some of these questions by email. So please feel free to email us. I'll put, um, or you can find my email, I'm sure, on the website. I can also put my email in the chat um, and I can put you in touch with all of the excellent presenters that you've heard and we'll be do our best to answer any questions uh, that way thank you very much everyone for attending it's really our privilege thank you thank you so much Abhinay, uh, and all the panelists i think it was so wonderful to hear about a topic uh, especially you know coming from the field of health i haven't i hadn't heard so much about such a deep research uh, and so wide far out you know both in terms of the geographic uh, areas that you've covered in the project and um, also in terms of you know the the parameters that you've looked at i think it's it's really impressive and wonderful all the great work that everybody you know from this group and you know the long list of researchers that have been shared in the beginning have done for the project uh, so thanks again all the panelists and thank you so much the audience members i saw that there were 150 plus at one point who had joined us uh, so really great. Thank you for all for joining us late in the evening and early morning, as I said earlier from the US. Um, and thank you to the team and the background who have been managing things uh, while we were all listening it, listening into the panelists. Thanks again. Have a great evening. Good night. Uh, great day ahead for people from wherever you're joining. Uh, I think the team has shared their email IDs in the chat box. Uh, I'm very sure all of you are able to see them. So please take a note, contact them for uh, any further questions that you have. Uh, what we will do, uh, the panelists, that we will share with you the list of all questions that everybody has shared. So in case you want to ponder them over and then respond uh, to each one of the the question, the, the, the audience members, that will also be fine. Uh, but signing off from here now, in the interest of time, we are right on time here. Uh, thanks again, everybody. Take care. Uh, and keep in touch. Bye. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.